back to Black News tonight. As we continue our coverage of the enormous humanitarian crisis at the border, let's take a moment to zoom out a little bit and look for some context. Now, last night, our show, we talked about and heard from guests, including Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, say that the U.S. foreign policies have contributed to the suffering in Haiti. Well, we want to take time to unpack that. So here with us now to explain some of the history behind our country's involvement in Haiti is our next guest. Pascal Robert is a Haitian American political contributor at Black Agenda Report, and he's also the co-host of This Is Revolution podcast. Pascal, welcome to Black News Tonight. Thank you for having me, Shannon. Now, before we go into a deeper history of this situation here, when we look at the horrible mistreatment of the asylum seekers at the border, what are your personal feelings about how they're being treated, especially being a Haitian American yourself? One of the most uh, prevalent feelings that I have is the irony of the fact that the United States is expelling Haitians at the border, particularly in the state of Texas, when part of the state of Texas is only received by the United States by the Louisiana Purchase that was made possible by the Haitian Revolution. So the irony to me is that the United mm -hmm. States has the gall to expel Haitians from a country that basically made the United States possible as a country that it is today. But it's also part of the consistent trend of the United States since the birth of Haiti as a nation state in 1804, basically trying to punish it for having the gall to be a, a country found on a black slave revolt against uh, uh, you know, France, England, and Spain, and liberating itself, which caused and was viewed as a major affront and threat to the United States at that time. Wow. Have you actually had an opportunity to speak to any of those people that have been affected or anyone in connection with those people? And what I was working? actually on the phone yesterday with a good friend of mine who has family members who have been in the immigration process. I have not spoken directly to immigrants, but he has family members who have been going through Brazil to Chile and one who is actually in Mexico right now mm -hmm. talking about the harrowing situation of, of migrants who are you know, basically leaving the Republic of Haiti, who is largely been destabilized as a, as a consequence of many policies by not only the United States, an institution called the Core Group, which is a consortium, consortium of uh, foreign policy embassies from France, uh, you know, Europe, Canada, that have constantly and consistently, you know, particularly in contemporary history, been functioning in a way that destabilizes and makes the capacity of Haiti to have a functioning government basically impossible. Well, let's go a little bit deeper into that. Can, can you explain how the U.S. policy towards Haiti created this condition for this latest wave of migration in the first place? I mean, to, to talk about U.S. policy to, to Haiti, we really have to start in the beginning from the fact that once Haiti became an independent republic, one of the first things the United States did was basically block off the ability for Haiti to, to uh, perpetuate trade with North America and the United States and stop it from economically developing. Remember that when the United States had its revolution, it was able to get, you know, basically loan guarantees from, from countries like uh, in Europe. To, to find itself why Haiti was getting economic embargoes and blockades. Not to mention that in 1915, the United States invaded Haiti, ripped off its coffers, you know, to fill the, the line, the, the coffers of Citibank from 1915 to 1934, basically uh, you know, punishing Haitians again, economically and politically. And since that occupation, basically Haiti has been a country that has not been a sovereign state. You can make the argument that Haiti has been a vassal state of the United States. There has not been a president since the Haitian occupation that was not put in power with, that, with the sanction of the United States. And if the United States did not like that president, they made sure to either take him out with a coup, like Jean Bertrand Aristide in 2004, and earlier was supported with the U.S. in 1991, or destabilize him like Dumas Estime in 1950, who again was thought to be too left for the U.S., and was also helped to be removed as well. So again, the United States has a consistent history of making sure that any Haitian president who even has the patina or the slight inclination of seeming like he wants to do something for the majority of Haitians who are economically deprived will be removed and they also ensure that they have uh, political leaders that are noxious enough to do the bidding of the U.S. at the State Department. And, you know, the, whether they be Democrat or Republican, that's a bipartisan consensus. It doesn't make a difference. Well, given that tumultuous history with the U.S., how does Haiti see the U.S. and how is that relationship between the two, especially on Haiti's behalf? Because, of course, the U.S. is going to make it seem like, oh, we're here to help. We're doing so well. We're helping and doing good. But how does Haiti see it? Well, I mean, there's, you, mean you have to distinguish between how the Haitian political class and government functions mm. and how the Haitian people, the Haitian people do not have ill will to America or the United States at all. And the Haitian political class and the Haitian government are basically what we use in Haiti. We can call them restavex or peasants for the U.S. 
they work at the behest. I, I wrote an article talking about the Cabana Boys of Haiti. That they are basically the Cabana Boys to the U.S. State Department, and we have to work at the behest of the U.S. State Department. Not to mention the fact that the Haitian government, with the infiltration of NGOs and the nonprofit industrial complex, can't even function. Something like over sixty percent of the government functionality of the Haitian government is fulfilled by NGOs that come largely out of the United States. So when people talk about the the, the incompetence and the corruption of the Haitian government, my response is what Haitian government? We haven't had a Haitian government, frankly, since you know, the United States, uh, you know, sponsored a coup to take out uh, Aristide in two thousand four. We've had these NGOs, particularly after the Haitian earthquake, that have fulfilled a large function of the Haitian government uh, government's uh, 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 functions. All of the U.S.'s involvement, is it possible for Haiti to even be able to have its own direction within its government? I think this would take a massive transformation of the way in which the world and the United States views the importance of Haiti as a nation, particularly its significance as the in, an independent black republic that fought against slavery to became the nation that it is. And I don't, I'm not going to make the excuses that say that Haiti can do it by itself. I think that a well-rational, strong-thinking Haitian diaspora coming together with foreign partners who are not trying to crush or punish this country, but daring to, to, to be a beacon of black liberty, might potentially have the chance of changing the dynamics and also helping stifle stifle the internal class uh, dynamics that have also been a burden to Haiti, Haiti's economic development and political development as well. All right, so for all those watching right now, whether they're black and brown people or allies for the community, what should our demand be right now to the White House and to our representatives in Congress? I think the most important thing is that we should demand that the Biden administration stop deporting Haitians to Haiti. This is a country that recently saw, you know, suffered a massive earthquake. Not only that, we had a presidential assassination and give the Haitians the right to, to actually fulfill their ab ability to request asylum to come to the United States. And if they are able to return to countries that they've been intermediary residents of, i.e. Chile or Brazil, perhaps they can find a way to send them back there first instead of sending them to Haiti, which is in a precarious situation right now. And before you go real quick, because we're almost out of time, have you heard any aspect of who is actually being allowed to stay? We've heard thousands have been allowed to stay, others have been sent back. Do we have any idea what makes a difference on who's allowed to stay and who's not? From what I've been told and what I'm reading is that people who are coming with young children are being given the priority in terms of mm. potentiality of being able to stay. I think that's one of the major barometers to decide. I've also been told also that men who are without wives who are by themselves are the ones who have the highest propensity to be turned back. All right, Pascal, thank you so much for your insight on this situation. All right, and we want you to join this conversation as well. We want to hear from you, so head over to BNC's Instagram and Twitter pages and let us know how you feel about this situation. Also, visit our website, bnc.tv, and subscribe to our YouTube page to check out clips from the show.